Oh, there it is. Oh, excellent. Good. All right, everyone. We're learning about how to get rid of death. There's even a Pusik that one of the prophets, Isaiah, <coughs> prophesies that death will be swallowed up forever and Hashem will wipe the tears off of all faces. <clears throat> Wipe the tears off of all faces. In other words, all the tears that have been cried in the past will be eradicated. Hashem will show us how it was really a very good thing that people died, even though we don't see it. Okay, so uh, click once. Whenever I double click, the whole thing gets smaller. All right. All right, I guess that's the maximum. Here we go. So what did we say last time? Remember, let's make a short summary of what we said. First of all, we said that somehow or other this idea of death, the fact of death is connected to Adam eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the Rebbe said we can explain it in two ways. One way is, and because God wanted there to be evil in the world, but he wanted it to be separate from good, and that it should be clear what is good and what is bad. And when Adam ate from the tree, it, this got confused. So God did not want this confusion and mixture of good and bad to be eternal which would happen if Adam ate from the tree of life. So he evicted him from Gan Eden, so he wouldn't eat from the tree of life. And he also, he brought death into the world because Adam was supposed to live forever. He was supposed to live forever. So in other words, the, the, according to that first explanation, the tree of knowledge of good and bad did not directly bring death into the world when Adam ate from it. Adam ate from it, and he mixed it up, good and bad. And so that Adam would not be able to live forever. In other words, God wouldn't be able to kill him. As he evicted him from the Garden of Eden, and then he killed him. He put death into the world. Death into the world. In other words, if, according to that first opinion, if Adam would have been evicted from Gan Eden, then, and he would have eaten from the tree of knowledge, uh, the tree of life, then God would not have been able to kill him. He would have had to figure some other way to do it. Something like that, we talked about it last time, like the Tower of Babel. God couldn't destroy it. He had to figure out a way to make them talk different languages and get into arguments and things like this. Because <clears throat> that's the way God set up the world. So then, after Adam was out of Gan Eden, and he had no shield against death. So then God could do what he wanted to. He brought death into the world in order to stop this mixing of good and bad that was internalized by Adam. So God brought death into the world so that this confusion would at least have an end, temporary end anyway. It wouldn't be eternal. Explanation number one. Explanation number two, that the tree of knowledge of good and evil, evil itself is death. And as soon as Adam ate from the tree, as he brought death into the world, because death is the opposite of God. God is pure life. God is pure existence. And death is the opposite of that. Okay, it says in the future, what's going to be that the death will be swallowed up. That's, let's, we'll go back to the sentence. In this future, death will be swallowed up. Why will it be swallowed up? Because there's going to be a tremendous revelation of the light of God. That's the second chapter, second paragraph. Greater even than it was in the days of King Solomon. When the King Solomon, there was a temple and all the Jews were in Israel. It was the ultimate ideal situation. And the whole world was affected by it. Until the Queen of Sheba, Malka, excuse me one second, Malka Shva, that she was so amazed by what she heard about King Solomon. And even when she came and saw him, she was even more amazed that this knocked out 
the idolatry and etc. of the whole world. Right? Eh, says the Rebbe, sort of right. Not 100%. Because it only knocked it out in, in let's say, an internal way, but in an external way, not. In other words, it was very easy for everyone to go back, if they, in the language of Hasidut, to clip ahead a yanika from the chitzonim. The, the powers of selfishness still had nurture from the, how do you say, the outside of people's personalities, accidental things that happen and, you know, things that don't seem to have anything to do with God. So let's say people purposely wouldn't go and make war with each other in the time of King Solomon, and they purposely wouldn't, you know, commit adultery or purposely wouldn't go against Hashem, do idolatry and then wars and things like that. They wouldn't do it purposely, but, you know, accidentally it could happen. And we see that after King Solomon died, it wasn't the... the because the holiness came from King Solomon out. So to speak, the world wasn't filled with this light of God. Right now, now we also have to remember, like we said last time, that what does it mean, light of God? The fact is, there's nothing except for God. The fact is, God creates everything all the time. And he creates it all from his love and from his kindness. But we just don't feel it. And and. Even deeper, God creates the world for a purpose. And that purpose is that everyone should do what it says in the Torah. Which seems pretty simple, but we see that, you know, virtually no one is doing it. Very few. And those that are doing it are doing it in a more external way. That's what it says. There's only maybe one total tzaddik in every generation that he really feels this what I'm talking about. So the idea of Mashiach is he's just going to reveal the truth. He's just going to reveal a fact. It's not that it's going to be some sort of a, you know, man from Mars or something is going to come. We're going to realize that we are men from Hashem. Everyone, the whole world is being created by God all the time. And this will be revealed. Truth will be revealed. Simple truth. Right? But it's so concealed now. And that's what God wanted. He wanted it to be. That's why he created a world. <clears throat> Okay, in any case, the idea is to reveal this truth. In the days of King Solomon, it was revealed sort of, you know, in a, in, a, in a piecemeal way. People were affected, but they weren't affected totally. The days of the Mashiach, there'll be this amazing revelation of the truth of what Hashem is. And then when that happens, it'll be like it was in Gan Eden before Adam ate from the tree, that there won't be any more death. It was just pure truth revealed. Okay, that was paragraph number two. Paragraph number three. Paragraph number three, we said, we can, we can sort of see this in ourselves now. The difference between the, what's going to be our relationship to evil, to bad, our relationship to selfishness. How do we look at it? How will we feel toward selfishness in the days of the Mashiach compared to what it was in the days of King Solomon. We can sort of see that now. Says the Rebbe, what, how, how can we see it now? In the chapter, 10th chapter of the Tanya, he explains what a tzaddik is. A tzaddik is like the ideal Jew, the ideal, in the end, the ideal human being. And a tzaddik is a person that he really feels Hashem. Right, right. That's, that's what you, you brought from the first paragraph. Very good. All right, now we're in the third paragraph. So we can see that a little bit now. There's two ways that we can relate to what's called ra, evil, selfishness. Two ways we can relate to it. Oh, hello, good morning. Okay. Two ways we can relate to selfishness in the world, selfish, our own selfishness, right? Two ways. Let's say, for instance, uh, uh, a person sees some food that he really wants to eat. He finds a wallet on the street, right? And it, he really needs the money. He really needs the money. So he picks it up, and his first urge is to take the money and to, you know, maybe put the wallet in the 
in the post office box or something, or give the wallet to a policeman, tell him, here, I found this. You know, should he do it or shouldn't he do it? So his urge, his immediate urge is, yeah, that's what I should do. I'm going to take the money and... Okay, but then he says, nah, 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 it's not a good idea. I won't do it. It says in the Torah I shouldn't do it. His feeling is that he wants to take the money. <clears throat> but he's a good person and he doesn't do it. Doesn't do it. Somebody gets him mad. He says a person, if you say, this is a better example even. He says a person that gets mad, he's like he's worshiping idols. Why? Because explains in the Tanya, if you get mad, that you're saying that this person did something to me, and the fact is God does everything. So if you lose it, you get angry, right? You're supposed to, if somebody does something bad to you, you're supposed to take them to court. You should maybe call the police. But anger inside that you get angry, right? That you're not supposed to do. Not supposed to, but everybody gets angry. You get angry, right? But what? You get angry and you say to yourself, ah, it's a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not going to do it. But it's automatic. So that's called sur meira, turning away from bad. In other words, you feel the bad. You attach yourself to the bad. But then after that, you say, I'm not going to bring it into deed. I'm not going to actually do it. There's a big space between what I think and what I feel and even what I say to what I actually do. So that little space I've got control over and I'm, I'm turning away from bad. That's called sur meira. Then there's another level. There's a level which is called meusbara, muasbara, that he hates. He's disgusted by evil. He's disgusted, right? Somebody does something bad to him, it doesn't come into his mind for an instant getting angry. He thinks Hashem wanted this to happen, right? Hashem he may, might roll down his window, say, my friend, you cut me off, you know, you, you can't do it, you can kill somebody. You know? But he's calm. You can see there's people that are like that. There's not even non-Jews are like that. Right? People that, there are people that are like that. The, the, the whole idea of getting mad, and it could be that they're a type of a person that, you know, they're full of, you know, they're normal people, but they just say getting mad is stupid. It's counterproductive. Disgusting. Right? There's some people that are, they were addicts, and they, they decide, I'm, I'm, what did I do to myself? You know, I took this drinking, it disgusts me. Ah, I don't want anything to do with it. It happens, it happens. So that, that's what's going to be in the whole world, how we're going to look at selfishness. It's going to be musbara, musbara, that the idea of doing anything selfish, anything that God doesn't want, will be automatically disgusting. Like somebody brought me a, a dead cat full of maggots or something to eat at a restaurant, right? You said, oh, ah. it just doesn't come into, you know, it doesn't come into our con it, it, the mind at all to do it. It's not in my feelings and our mind. I don't have to turn away from bad. The bad disgusts me. I'm already away from it. That's what's going to be in the future. That people will feel that going against God is going against even common sense. It's going against my feelings. Going against, right? To go against God is like cutting off my hand. No one would do a thing like that. So we can see a little bit even now what the feeling is going to be in the future that's going to get rid of evil. Because what do we say? Evil comes from this mixture and confusion of bad and good. Bad is selfishness. That's what bad is, selfishness. And good is Jewishness. I, th I think I told you this, I don't, maybe a lot of times, but Rabbi Mendel Futavas, my one of my teachers, he said, the cause of depression is trying to make yourself big. I'm not big enough, I deserve more, right? When I don't succeed, I get all depressed, things aren't going my way. And the cause of happiness is trying to make God big. Right? Everything that happens, Hashem did it. Hashem knows what he's doing. Now I have to figure out how I can do my part to improve the situation. Right? By doing an act, by, doing, by, by changing my attitude, something. But God is doing, that keeps a person positive all the time. Making God, trying to make yourself big, that's the cause of depression and anger and so this idea of selfishness, that's what's called bad. When a person can look at himself in an objective way, according to what the, what does the Torah want? What does the Torah want me to do? Eventually it can come to the place where he can even hate evil. It says in the Tanya, where's in the 14th chapter, that if you pretend to be a tzaddik, that eventually maybe Hashem will help you and all of a sudden it'll happen. You'll really, you know, really be, how do you say, happy to do a commandment. 
happy to do a commandment, you automatically will turn from anything that the Torah says you shouldn't do. Automatically. Okay, that was chapter three. Now we're on chapter four. Okay, we, we, we started this also. Chapter four says that the, in the end, it's going to have to be God that's going to wipe out death from the world. And God usually doesn't do things on his own. Sometimes he does, like took us out of Egypt, gave us the Torah. But usually it doesn't work that way. God did not create the world in order to give out free gifts. God wants us to work. He wants us to be his partners. God got very angry at the Meraglim, the spies, you know, in the desert, when the Jews that didn't want to go into the land of Israel, because they wanted to remain in the desert and just receive from God, receive uh, water from a rock and receive clouds of glory protection and to receive manna from heaven, just to receive. That's what they wanted to do. Then in the desert, they knew they were God's people. They were, God says, that's not what I want. I want partners. <clears throat> you have to do first, and then I will react. And then after that, we realized that it was all, it was 100% Hashem anyway. Right? Hashem gave us the power, He gave us the mind, but still, Hashem wants us to be His partners. He creates us. We're very, very important to Hashem. So everything depends on the future with this big revelation that's going to be that there's going to be wiping out death forever. It depends on us coming to this level of mius bara, of hating being disgusted by selfishness. Says the Rebbe, okay, first of all, in order to really hate evil, in order to be disgusted by being selfish, this depends to a very great measure on having love for God. Love for God. So having love for God, this brings more hatred for evil, disgust, for selfishness, being disgusted by it. And that, in turn, brings that Hashem will also be disgusted by evil, and he'll wipe out death from the world. No, says the Rebbe, if we're waiting for that to happen, that we're supposed to be disgusted by evil, and that's what's going to cause, then it's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. I mean, the Jewish people are not going to get to this level of hating evil automatically. It's just not going to happen. Right? It says even more that Every generation, there's maybe one tzaddik that really hates. Yeah, this is in the first chapter of the Tanya. There's one tzaddik that really hates evil. The evil within we're talking about. Not this next door neighbors. And that everybody does. Talk about the evil inside of yourself. To point to somebody else and say, that's evil. That's a mullet. That, that, that's easy to do. <laughs> that's a, to a certain degree, it's even fun to do. No, we're talking about the person who hates his own egotism, his own selfishness. Right? That he hates that. Who does that? It says uh, only only big tzaddikim. So the Rebbe says, so how can we come to this level that we, by means of us being disgusted by evil, that is what's going to cause Hashem to do it, and then Hashem will wipe out evil. <clears throat> so the Rebbe said, it's very simple. Every Jew has certain times of his life, maybe even just once, when he really feels Hashem. It's not necessarily a religious feeling. Suddenly he feels, I mean, in, in a way, Judaism in, in that, Judaism certainly is a religion, but in, it's much more than that. It's the feeling of reality. Right? Every Jew, once in a while in his life, he totally does not think about himself. Totally not. He does a good deed, maybe one time when he's praying, one time he goes by the Rebbe, one time he totally does not think about himself all, at all. All he thinks about is, I'm a Jew. There were Jews that gave their lives because of this feeling. They did not think about themselves at all. It could be that they were apostates their whole life, and all of a sudden, at the last moment, they said, Shema Yisrael, and they were willing to burn on the stake rather than bow down to the cross or something. I think that's what the whole Inquisition was about. <clears throat> so every Jew has this one moment, at least, in his life, when suddenly he feels godliness. Remember, we learned in the Sikha, we'll go back to the Sikha again, that the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, 
was, and he said that he compares that to the clouds of glory in the, in the Torah, clouds of glory, <coughs> that it surrounds all the Jews equal and, and protects them. That the previous Rebbe was in a bunker in the beginning of uh, World War II in Warsaw, <coughs> and the Germans were bombing. There was about, I don't know, 100 people stuffed into this bunker. All of them were Jews. And there were all sorts of different Jews there. Jews that were non-religious, Jews that were anti-religious, Jews that were that had been, become apostates, Jews that were just... And when the bombs started coming close, as everyone screamed out, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad, suddenly opened up the Jewishness inside of them. So every Jew, there's somehow, that's what's called in the Tanya, it's called the short way, the long way and the short way. Look in the beginning, the introduction of the Tanya, the first page, to inter explain how it's close to you to serve God in a long way and a short way. That's the short way. Suddenly it wakes up, up, I'm a Jew. So every Jew has this moment in his life. There's stories about Jews in, in, in Russia. They didn't even know they were Jewish. And one day their mother tells him he's Jewish. All of a sudden he knows he's Jewish. This, the, I have a good friend, Yoram Yamit, Yoron Yamit. He makes bris milas <coughs> for Jews that have, older Jews that have not had a lot of them from Russia. And there's people, he said, that are 80, 90 years old and they make circumcisions from Russia. They, they know they're a Jew. They found out they're a Jew. They want to be circumcised. They don't care if it's dangerous. They don't care about anything. They don't care about, right? All of a sudden, there's no selfishness. It's just Hashem. Every Jew has one moment like that. That one moment is enough to be a, 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 an impetus, a, what do we call it? A, 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 um, um, I forgot the word. <clears throat> a motivation to Hashem. That Hashem will react to what we do. That's a very basic thing in Hasidus. Hashem reacts to what we do. Hashem reacts to our prayers. We have an effect on Hashem. Nachat Ruach Shema. But to have an effect on Hashem that will wipe out evil, it has to be that we truly despise evil. When is that going to happen? Says every, every Jew has it, a minute in his life, a second. It's something that comes sometimes unexpectedly. Now we're on chapter Hey, and that's where we're at. That's what it means. That's what it means. The death will be wiped out forever. Calls a man that all of the time, Shenlon Nishalmu, that there was not completed a dying yet, a birurim, all the time that has not been finished, the birurim and the refinements, where are we? Birurim, the refinements, Vahatovara, <clears throat> and bad and good are mixed up one and the other. All right, what, can, maybe can we talk a little bit about this refinement thing? Birurim, it's spoken a lot about to Birurim means to, what do you say? Uh, to, to clarify. Borer is taking the bad from the good or the good from the bad. That's Borer. It's to separate. Borer means to separate. Bad from good. Good from bad. <clears throat> the laws of Shabbos. Borer is to separate. What is it? Shin Yotet, is it? Look and, look and see. Borer, <clears throat> I don't remember. Means to separate the good from the bad. What do we say? That the whole sin of Adam was when he ate from the tree of knowledge of good and bad, be previously good and bad was external. And he could see it clearly. As soon as he took it inside, everything got mixed up. Right? Like a person that God forbid, takes drugs, takes heroin. First, it's the most ridiculous, insane thing. Who would want to take heroin? It's just, for what? But when a person takes it, it feels so good, and that a lot of people, that's it. They just can't stop. All of a sudden, inside, the thing that's the worst thing in the world becomes the best thing in the world. Right? And anyone who tries to stop him, which that's the best thing in the world for him, is the worst thing in the world. So everything becomes confused. That's what happened when Adam, that was just an example, Adam ate from the tree. Right? Since then, Adam was so important, he didn't realize how important he was. And we also don't realize how important we are. That Adam's little action like that confused the whole world for all time. Brought death and confusion into the world for all time. <clears throat> 
And then when God gave the Torah, he gave the chance to get out of it, but the Jewish people worshiped the golden calf. So now it's still mixed up. So that's our job to do borer. What does it mean, borer? To remove the bad from the good. How do we remove the bad from the good? With the Torah. The Torah tells us clearly what is bad and it tells us what is good. The Torah tells us clearly what is bad and what is good. One of the things that, for instance, the Torah tells us to do is we have to listen to the rabbis, right? The Torah also defines what a rabbi is. So not everybody can interpret the Torah however they want to. We have to separate bad from good. That's what the whole entire Talmud is, right? These great rabbis, geniuses, most of them, the, the, the Tanayim, the early ones in the Mishnah, whatever, they could raise the dead. It says they had the power to raise the dead. There's all religions based on some guy who says he raised one dead person. These people could raise the dead. And nevertheless, they had differing opinions about what certain laws are, because God wanted them to have differing opinions. These are the words of God. The point of the arguments was to make birurim, was to clarify what is good and what is bad, how Jews after that can use the Torah to be objective. So I have a big desire to do something. Well, that's where the good and bad are mixed. Right? It's very hard to figure what are my motives. Am I doing it for Hashem or am I doing it for me? I want to. Or maybe I'm doing it because for me and I'm such a smart person that I can justify, according to the Torah, it says that every one of the people in Sanhedrin, they were so, so, so genius, genius. And they knew the Torah so well that each one of them could bring 150 reasons to prove that a rat is permissible to eat. Khan, what is it? Khan Durachim the Tyre the Sheretz. They could bring 150 reasons to explain anything you want. Anything you want. Give them a money, but you put like a, one of those machines, you put money in it, gives you an answer, fortune machine. Right? That's why it says that if you bribe, bribing a, even a wise man, even a tzaddik, it says it makes their minds crazy. These people were so genius that they could make, it's very, very difficult now to, to find out what is bad and what is good. What is good and what is bad. Very, very difficult. That's one of the main things Mashiach is going to do. So that's called birur on the tzutzos. And that happens inside of each and every one of us, right? You want to get angry at someone. You want to, all of a sudden, that's what you want. And you're sure it's right, but your mind says, let's look at this objectively. What does the Torah say? What does the Torah say? Right? And as soon as you say, what does the Torah say? Then all of a sudden, you're starting to fix up. You're starting to get rid of this confusion caused by Adam. You're separating the bad from the good. You're separating the bad from the good. So that's the whole idea of <clears throat> birurim, clarifying the world. And it doesn't have to be that all the Jews do it. It has to be that one Jew does it. Which Jew? Me. Or everyone who's reading this, everyone is listening. It's up to me to do it. Don't forget about it, what the other people do. A little bit of light pushes away a lot of darkness. Very important, important principle. Don't make the same mistake that Adam thought. Well, who am I? What am I? It says nowadays the good and the bad are mixed up, one with the other. Kolel Gam is a man Beit Hamikdash, even at the time when the Beit Hamikdash was in existence. Shlomo, even the days of King Solomon, the Kaimasir of Musa, it says that the moon was complete. The moon is compared to this world. The creation is compared to the Jewish people. It says that the moon was complete. Was this world was receiving like the 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 ult ultimate amount of godliness that it could back then. Nevertheless, there still was, even in the days of King Solomon, there was the idea of death. In order that there shouldn't be any bad at all. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that there was death. Why was there death? In order that, that there shouldn't be <coughs> eternal bad. If people didn't die, then bad would continue always. People could think that, you know, I can do what I want. I'm never going to die. Kanishkir, like we said before. 
So in one way, in that weird way, death is a good thing. Zeu, that's what it means. Gama, Tom, it's like in war. Right? Is it forbidden to kill? Forbidden to kill. What about in war? Someone comes to try to kill you. Can you kill him? Yes. So each one of us has inside of us this bad. So God says the only way to get rid of it is to just kill people. That's it. They die. Old age. Whatever reason it is. But as soon as there's no evil inside of us, evil is, a, is, a, is a, not such a nice word because it's misused by other religions. As long as there's no selfish, as long as there's selfishness inside of us, right, then there's always going to be death. But as soon as selfishness is gone and we think only about the Creator and how good the Creator is and how wonderful, and how the Creator is creating and how really there's nothing except for the Creator. And this world is so amazing. And I'm amazing. I'm being created every moment. If we think in terms of the Creator, then we think objectively. And we get excited about the Creator and we're happy. But if we think all the times about ourselves, we're never happy. We're never, very temporarily, you can be, you know, jump around a little bit. You win the, the, the lottery or something. Then you're happy until you, all of you, your relatives take it from you, whatever. This is the reason that also it says that in the future, <clears throat> because there's always going to be this selfishness in the world, so there's always going to be death in the world. <clears throat> until people, Hashem reacts to those Jews that really hate evil, even for one instant. That's why it says that even the tzaddikim, yachzerul afran. It says that even the greatest tzaddikim will go back to their dirt. Sha'achat korem techiat ametim. At least one second before the raising of the dead. In other words, there will have to be some element of death. The hagam she'en rima sholetet bayam. It says that the tzaddikim, even though that their bodies remain whole, and that worms don't rule over them. The Rebbe once said that it could be that the people would just go to sleep for an instant. The Shazu, even now, there are tzaddikim, that they're eternalists in the, in the Gomorrah. Where is it in, in Baba Kama? About how someone went down into Maratha Machpel and they saw Sora and Adam, and Sora and Avram, and that Sora was uh, whatever they were talking, whatever. Shekodem Tchiatamitim, right before the raising of the dead. Hayagufa Kaim, there's Sadiqim, the 3,000, 4,000 years. Meot Alfim Shana, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, that's Abraham was like almost 4,000 years ago. Moshe was 3,000, whatever years ago. And these, their, their bodies are still there, but they're dead. What do you mean that they're dead? They, they live forever. What's going to be? It says, in the raising of the dead, it's going to be a whole different business. Nevertheless, before the raising of the dead, they'll have to return back to their, to their dirt. They'll have to like disintegrate for one instant. And who's going to see this? Everybody's going to die. Because by means of the sin of the tree of knowledge, there was mixed up bad and good in the whole world and every atom of the world, in every quark and every whatever it is, subatomic particles, there is bad and good. It's all mixed up. Lochim, therefore, Gamgutum and Tzadikim, therefore, even the bodies of the greatest Tzadikim will have to be refined. Okay, what about Tzadikim that says that there are Tzadikim, that they went into heaven alive and that death had no effect on them? We just can't see them. We just can't see them. It says Elijah the prophet, there's Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. These are tzaddikim that they're alive, but we can't see them. Death does not rule over them. There's a midrash that says, what is it? Nine went into heaven and they didn't taste the taste of death. In other words, they still exist in their bodies. Interestingly enough, it says the ninth one is the Mashiach. Mashiach is going to be a person that we won't be able to see him, but he still is alive. Just like Elia Onavi, but maybe more. That's why Elijah is the, going to be the one that's going to announce Mashiach, I have no idea what this means, but I did see a wonderful explanation in a book which is called Avodat HaKodesh by Rav Meir Gabai, which is a book that was written 600 years ago, something like that. And it's all ideas of Kabbalah, but they're explained. It's almost like the same thing as Hasidut. They say that the Hasidim of the Baal Shem Tov used to learn it. 
And there it explains very well how the, the Mashiach is going to appear to be dead, but he really won't be dead. And that's going to be all the Jewish people are going to be like that. Anyway, that is not our point now, even though Mashiach is always our point. But everyone, God is going to swallow up dead, death. But before he swallows up the death, even one instant, the whole world is going to have to go through this amazing purification. Every body, it says, will return, will like disintegrate and go back to dirt, and then it'll come back again. The man, the nub says, oh, here we go. Now he's going to appear. We're going to come to a part of this thing that I truly do not understand, and maybe we can make something up over here with because, okay, look, and therefore, gam gufo, therefore, even the bodies of tzaddikim will have to be refined. Masha'enkim, which is not the case after the raising of the dead. After the raising of the dead, there still is going to be a world, and there still will be people, and the people will be the same people, and you'll be able to recognize them at the raising of the dead. When it says that God will take away all impurity from the world. There won't be this thing of egotism. We'll feel the truth. We won't fool ourselves. Then, lo az mita, there will not be any more death. The gamma goof, even the physical body, yichyeh, will live b'chayim nitzchim, with eternal life. Okay, now there is a midrash. And it's brought in this, in this mimer from the Rebbe Marash, where there's an argument between Rabbi Hanina and Rabbi uh, Yeshua ben Levi. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, by the way, was, another, was one of those who went into heaven and didn't die. <clears throat> there's a story about how he stole the, the sword of the, of the angel of death. Anyway, we'll talk about that maybe. So it says an argument over there with Rabbi Hanina and Rabbi uh, Yeshua ben Levi. And the, what do, are the, the non-Jews going to also live forever? Will they, will they be raising of the dead? Will they live forever? So Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi says yes. And Rabbi Hanina says no. They're not going to. Okay, what's the answer? We'll see. I mean, even if it, they won't raise up in the dead, it means that they'll be in heaven eternally, which is certainly not so bad. I mean, I don't really understand why there has to be the raising of the dead. What's wrong with just staying up in heaven forever? I mean, heaven is infinite pleasure, being close to God. But somehow or other, the raising of the dead is something that's, you can't say it's higher than that because it's not a level. It's some sort of a revelation of truth. It's, it's impossible really to, under, to fathom. What it is, it's just pure godliness will be revealed. So, you know, don't worry, non-Jews. You'll get a very nice reward. You did, did good, you'll get good. In any case, here we're talking about this thing which makes no sense, but it's infinite, infinite revelation of truth. And this is what's called the raising of the dead. So he says, Gam ladea, even according to that opinion, See, let's look at footnote number 37. See over here. That opinion, here's footnote 37. Uh, 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 there it is. They are Rav Hanina. This is the opinion of Rav Hanina. The Baba, the Breshis Rabba. Perachav, you can look over there. Also in the Gomorrah and Psachim, Samachet and Sanhedrin, Sadak Aleph, over there also talks about this in general. So it says, even according to Rav Hanina, that the non Jews will die, they will not raise up in the raising of the dead. So he says, that's not also so simple. Look at here, this is the part. Gam ladea, the mayash katuv, that what it says, kinar ben meashana yomut, that what it says that a child, a hundred years old, will die. This means simply, in other words, also the non-Jews. This is only ben ogea le ben neinoach. This is only regarding to the non-Jews. The non-Jews, they will die. Right, when they're a hundred, whenever, whatever age it is. Okay, Masha Enkin, which is not regarding the Jewish people. The Jewish people, to them, there won't be any death. So the non-Jews will die, right? But the Rebbe says, not 100%. Yeterim even more, the Gam Amita, even this type of death. 
that will be to B'nai Noah, which will be for the non-Jews, that's only according to this opinion of Rabbi Hanina, <clears throat> he is lo misa mamash. It doesn't mean that they will really die like death is now. Elo, but nefila. It will be what we call a descent. The man the nafil midarge echrim mis. A person that falls from his level is called dead. Ukamavur b'maimer, like it's explained in the maimer, the al yudid that by means of shenitzutzo takadusha that the sparks of holiness nivlu b'hem are in them yidboru will be refined. In other words, all of the good and the holiness which is what's keeping all of the non-Jews in the world alive. I mean, the same God is creating us, is creating the Jews, is creating the non-Jews. This power of creation that's creating the non-Jews, even though non-Jews were not created to serve God, they were created to be good people and to improve the world. Jews were created to serve the Creator. So that good which is in the non-Jews <laughs> will be refined in them, the Ya'alu Lamaila, and it will raise up above. In other words, I guess this means and the souls will be in a high level of heaven. But the Rashabahim, but the physicality, namely their physical, Shalayam Shinikra Bashem Ra Be'erich, then it suits us and compared to these sparks which of holiness which are in them, will fall below. In other words, the body will fall below, their spirit will raise up. Okay, what does this mean? Uh, I'll give you my guess. This is what I think. The essence of a person is that he has free will. He can choose between bad and good. All of those non-Jews that in the course of their life they chose to do good, <clears throat> and if, if they had to have chosen good because it says in the Torah, the Rambam says yes, but anyway, they chose good. So their souls, they get a reward. You get reward according to what you do. So they get rewarded. What about their bodies? What about their bodies? So it says their bodies will be subjected to death. But not death like we know it now. It'll just be that the bodies will drop a level. So if you ask me what this means, is that there will be taken from them a certain degree of free will. For instance, a person that is uh, drunk, a person that's drunk, a person that's under the influence of some sort of a drug, right? So he feels very good, but he hasn't got any free will anymore, right? You, you, would you like to eat? Uh, would you like to go to the park? Uh, uh, it feels good, right? He's just coasting. So maybe that, that's maybe what it means. It means that the souls of all the non-Jews that did good will be elevated. That's their consciousness. That's who they are. That's who a person is, is conscious. That will be elevated to higher levels of what heaven or whatever. And the bodies will be, how do you say, calm. Calm. They won't have this free choice to do bad and good. They'll what's called drop a level. They'll drop a level in in their ability to have free choice. Anyway, that's what I think. However, it's going to be it's going to be very good, and it all depends on us Jews hating bad, hating selfishness. Ellen Afila, the man the nuffil, because one who falls from his level is called dead. Ukamavur, like it's explained in the Mimer, in this Mimer from the Rebbe Marash in Tafshin, where I have the Mimer over here, Tafshin Chavches, where is here to see? Tafshin Chavches, you can see the Mimer, do you have it? Do other people see what I see? Here we go, there. Oh, here it is. Torah Shmuel. The Mimer of the Rebbe Marash, by the way, the fourth Rebbe of Chabad are just amazing, fantastic. There were years that I just learned those Mimer. Mikamocha, maybe we'll even learn that. I think it's even written, and maybe you can even download it. The aliyadeshen it's the kedusha. The by means the others of people. The zeo, that's what it means in the umas olam. This is only in the non-Jews. Says that the non-Jews that their souls will be elevated and their bodies will like drop a little bit of a level. Masha ein ke in Israel, which is not the case. The Jewish people yitale gamaguf also the body. Now what I said that the non-Jews the the bodies will drop a level in their souls. This is only according to Rabbi Hanina, but according to Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, they'll also have this level of the raising of the dead. Shagam, also, guf, yezun, miruchnius, that also their bodies will be fed from spirituality, just like the soul. By the way, the non-Jews, even the non-Jews that do merit into, let's say, the raising of the dead, 
It has to be that they do the seven Noahide commandments and that they do the seven Noahide commandments not because it's a logical thing or it's a good thing, which it is a good thing, you know, not to kill, not to have adultery, not to this, but they do it because it says in the Torah, because it comes from God's Torah. Right? That's what it says, the, the Jewish people, they're the ones that are going to make this revelation all over the world. And so it says that all this that we talked about, these wonderful ideas about being disgusted by bad, about wiping out death from the world, that death is an not a necessary part of the world. It's just become ingrained in every fiber of the world, but really it's not supposed to be there. And there will be a wonderful world without it, where right? the world can get along very well without addictions and aggression and depression and, and selfishness. The world can get very along very well without disease and without the pest. And, and I want to just repeat, repeat one more time, because I think this is very important. And this is certainly the opinion of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. <clears throat> that I heard once a, an argument between economists. I said this a lot of times, but I want to say it again because I think it's very important. I've heard, I heard a long time ago, I heard an argument between two economists on the radio. I mean, a really long time I heard this argument, maybe 60, 70 years ago, 60 years ago. And um, one was saying that according to 99% of the economists in the world, there's too many people in the world. And that the, the, the bad ones will affect the good ones and there'll be war and there won't be food enough for everybody and it'll just cause everybody to die. So we got to get rid of some of the people. As far as I know, this is what Bill Gates and these people, they think. This is what at least I heard. Too many people. You, got, you, got, you have to, how do you say... Dalil, you have to sort of uh, weed out, you know, the unnecessary ones, the black ones, and you know, who knows, Mexican. One of the the other one said, the other psych, the other uh, economist said exactly the opposite. You know, every human being is precious. Every human being is created in the image of God. Maybe they're not created in your image, but they're created in the image of God. And that the more people in the world are better. The more people, the better. And this, the, 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 pre, the, the previous economist said, how can you say a stupid thing like that? I mean, the, the, according to all the opinions, there's not going to be enough food to go around. There's going to be disease. It's going to affect everybody. So the, he said, I'll tell you why. He said, because we see that major changes in the world for the good usually are by one person or a small group of people. You know, penicillin, electricity, or whatever. The more people in the world that there are, the more chance that this one person is going to stand up. And he'll figure out a way, you know, to make food from air, to refine the, the sea. To, that one person will stand. So therefore, the more people there are, the more chance that the world will be refined. And this is, this is according to science. Here, according to Torah, we have to, that's even without faith. Just simple science that says that 1% one, one says that that's the way it's going to be. Here, according to the Torah, it's exactly the opposite. According to the Torah, according to faith, for certainly that's the way it's going to be. For sure it's going to be like that. It's not going to be 99% against one, 99 bad against one good. It's going to be 100% good. And every human being is going to be precious. There's no doubt about it. When will this be revealed? But poil, mamish, actually, lamatam yasar, tafakim, below, what's called ten tefachim, in this physical world, it won't just be in my morim and in our minds and our ideas. The ge'ula amiti treshlema, because what we want is for these things to be revealed in front of our eyes by means of Mashiach Tzikeni, the Mashiach will be like Moshe. He'll not just free the Jews from Egypt, he'll free the Egypt, take the Egypt out of the Jews. <clears throat> he'll free the Egypt, the Jews from their internal Egypt that every Jew will love God, will love good, and will be despised by egotism and destruction. Mashiach Tzikeinu will do it, change the priorities of all mankind, and then Hashem will make big miracles, Bekor of Mamish, soon, now, Mamish. Okay, wonderful. We'll see what Maimon will learn tomorrow. I'll decide tomorrow. Maybe I'll write for somebody. Now let's learn the Sikh of the Rebbe. Hello, what's this nice picture there? What was that nice picture? What was that? Okay, wonderful. Let's learn, continue the mimer of the Rebbe.